Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Cadman. Um, I work for a, a small uh, sustainability consultancy called Action Sustainability. We're notionally based in London, but these days with uh, home working and virtual working, we're, we're dotted uh, all across the globe, quite literally. So we have a, a webinar today here with uh, three guest speakers to talk about climate change and carbon and uh, the, the climate emergency. Um, but we're setting it in the context of being one year on from COP26 um, in Glasgow. We've obviously recently just finished COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. Um, so we thought this would be a good opportunity to look back on what progress have we made and where do we need to go next. So we've got uh, an hour to an hour and a half to um, discuss these issues. So just as some brief um, house rules, we are going to have some, uh, some questions and some polls out to use the audience in a little while. We're going to use Mentimeter just to get your view on uh, five questions that we've got for you. So get your smartphone ready to hand. Um, if you've got any questions for our three speakers, please use the Q&A box within Zoom. You'll see that there's two little speech bubbles on your screen with the letters Q&A underneath them. Please use that to post any questions you have whenever you think of them. We will be having a moderated Q&A session at the end where we'll pick up as many of your questions as possible um, and put them to the speakers. If you see someone else's question that you like uh, and think is uh, worthy of um, being asked or being promoted, then please do like it and that lifts it up in the, uh, the Zoom functionality. Um, so it will have um, higher prominence. Uh, we'll ask you for your, sh your feedback at the end to share your feedback. That'd be really good. Let us know what you like and what else you'd like to hear about from us. Um, and we will be sharing the, uh, the slides uh, after the session. Um, so if you want to take notes, please do. Um, any screenshots, but we will be sharing a PDF copy of the slides afterwards. Okay. So just to introduce my uh, three guest speakers for today, um, we've got uh, Peter Meesham, who's Director of Supply Chain Sustainability at Restaurant Brands International. Uh, we've also got Matthew Adams, Assistant Director for Climate Change and Natural Resources at Harrow Council uh, in the West of London. And Zee Kumar, who is Sustainability and Climate Change Technical Manager at uh, NSG Group, uh, Nippon Sheet Glass Group. So thank you to them for speaking today. Uh, I know they've got some interesting things to say uh, from their respective companies' points of views, their organisational point of view on climate change and carbon. Okay. So as I say, we've uh, recently finished COP27 um, in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. It seemed to rattle around fairly quickly since COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, and it was very interesting from my point of view, just to look back on uh, what came out of those two different COPs and what the progress has been. Uh, for those of you who remember, COP26 in Glasgow had lots of uh, great proclamations about reducing this by so much percent by such and such a date. So for example, reducing uh, global methane emissions by 30% by the year 2030 compared to where they were in 2020. So lots of great, big, bold statements that obviously need to be backed up by action. Sharm El Sheikh does a lot of um, expectation riding on the back of Glasgow as to where this would go. There's been a mixed reaction, if I'm being honest, onto, uh, in terms of what has come out of it. So I just want to take you through a, a couple of brief things on that. Um, so mitigation is still a big issue. Uh, that's about reducing our emissions as much as possible um, to keep in line with the Paris Climate Change Agreement for one and a half degrees warming or limiting the warming to one and a half degrees. Still some good work going on that, but more to be done. It's interesting that the adaptation piece got greater prominence. I think Glasgow was where it really came to the fore um, and it was reiterated more in Sharm El Sheikh as well. Sadly, though, some of the, the finances for that haven't yet come forward. We agreed that we'd be uh, putting in 100 billion US dollars a year as a, as a planet into adaptation. Um, that hasn't materialized in anywhere near the, the shape or form that is needed. Uh, so that was uh, re-emphasized in Egypt that we need to really double down on that and provide uh, that funding so we can adapt our assets and our structures and our buildings and all our production facilities and supply chains to a, a changing world. But what did come out of Sharm El Sheikh, which was interesting, was the, the piece around loss and damage. Um, some people called it reparations, which has kind of a, a military tone to it. Some people called it uh, compensation, which very much has, has a legal tone to it. But this was about providing a fund to say um, and support those nations, those states that have received the brunt of climate change lately. We all saw the, the, the horrendous floods in Pakistan, for example, on the news in the last few months. 
some of these countries that are it's very ironic actually it's very a cruel irony that many of the countries that are receiving the brunt of climate change are the ones who have caused the least of it so this is why those discussions on loss and damage how we can support those um those countries um to to, to repair what's happened um to use a a, a, pro, a rather um cliched smoking analogy they're a bit like the passive smokers they haven't been smoking themselves and yet they're they're receiving the impact from it so a loss and damage fund would be a welcome thing yet to be decided what that actually looks like and how much is in it but the principle at least has been established and in terms of what we need to do as a planet there's there's uh, quite a bit of work to do but we it's it's a positive move that we can make and uh, the window is still open um so what we currently have is uh coming out of all these conference of parties these cop meetings are a, a range of pledges and targets in the language of the COP, they're called nationally determined contributions, NDCs. And that's what each country is pledging it will do in the future. And that's what's highlighted in that red box about bringing the, uh, the, the, the curve down in terms of our emissions and minimizing the worst impacts uh, as much as possible of climate change. But you're still seeing um, some global warming over two degrees um, above and beyond those pre-industrial levels. So where we need to get down to is this one and a half degree pathway. That's what we're really aiming for. That's what came out of Paris, and we, we, we need to keep pushing our efforts on that uh, one and a half degree pathway. One interesting report that um, highlighted this, this gap was from the United Nations um, that came out in the run up to COP27. They publish a report annually called the Emissions Gap Report on what we still need to do as a, as a planet. Uh, and here they analyze all those pledges, all those targets, all those nationally determined contributions. What's the gap? What else do we need to do? And what they've calculated is that um, for us to reach that one and a half degree pathway, there's a 20 billion ton gap as it currently stands by 2030. So that this is not today, this is by 2030. There's a gap of what we need to do, what other pledges, what extra work we as a planet need to put forward in terms of reducing our emissions as much as possible. So this 20 billion ton gap is, is there. We need to work on that collaboratively um, across all sectors. And just on the screen, what you're looking at there is some of the context of um, some of those uh, some of those pledges and targets that we have, whether that's uh, UK level or European Union level. So that's some of the context. Um, lots to be going for, uh, lots of op optimism as well that we can still move there. Um, and I've got a, a great question for the, the panel a bit later about where do we go next? So that's the context. If we go and, uh, now to move to Mentimeter, so this is the polling software. Just while my colleague Billy is getting that set up, I'll just talk you through what it's about. Uh, if you've ever used Slido or Kahoot or any of those, it's very similar to that, but a lot, lot simpler. Um, there's a screen from, from Billy. You simply go to menti.com. Um, it's easiest if you do it on your smartphone, if you have a smartphone to hand. Um, if you don't have a smartphone, then just open up another um, tab on your browser and go to menti.com. You can use the QR code if you are um, tech savvy uh, enough, better than me. And you simply enter that eight digit code that you see on the screen, 81055550. And you'll get um, a very simple screen. This is all anonymous, by the way. You don't need to put your name in. So we'll just give it a few seconds for people to join. It's best if you're using your computer browser to use Chrome rather than Internet Explorer or Edge. For some reason, Chrome works better or Firefox, one of those, but not Microsoft Edge. But like I say, the, the simplest way is if you've got a smartphone to hand, just open up your, your browser on your smartphone, go to menti.com. And punch in the code. Okay, so I can see eight people have joined. Are any more of you looking to join? Got five questions. It'd be lovely to hear your views on this. Cool, excellent, more people joining. Like I say, it's all anonymous. So don't worry for you that there's no wrong answer. Okay, should we uh, go on to the first question, please, Billy, if you wanna push on to the, the questions themselves. So. First question, does your organization have a carbon reduction strategy? You've got four answers. Yes, in development, no, don't know. You just tick one of the options and press enter. A 
Okay, so it's looking good. The vast majority have, of you have got something or it's in development, which is really good. Okay, super. So most people have, that's really good to see. When I used to run these a couple of years ago at the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic, for example, the numbers look um, a lot different, um, not as pleasing as they do now. Okay, great. Should we go on to question two, please? So what carbon reductions have you taken or you're planning to take? So what you're doing here is there's, there's a word cloud. So you can enter a short sentence, a few words. You can do that several times before you hit enter. And then those words appear on the screen as a word cloud. So is it, your, are you looking at your, your fleet? Are you looking at your supply chain? Are you looking at your, uh, your buildings? Those kinds of things. Okay, supply chain, solar farms, yep. Started an ESG department, okay, that's good. So getting the right resources internally, getting the right um, people to come and support you. Organic cotton, yeah, so if you've got workwear, if you've got uniforms, for example, low carbon materials. Uh, retrofitting is really important as well. Uh, if you're in the built environment, something like 70 or 80% of the building stock that we have now will still be out there standing in 30, 40 years time. So retrofitting is, is as important, if not more important than um, how we build new buildings. Data centers, yep. Packaging. So lots of different things. And this is exactly the kind of point that I'm, I'm glad to see is coming out. There's no one magic silver bullet for this. There's lots of different things we can do depending on our situation uh, and depending on our budget as well and our availability of resource. Um, It'd be great if we could all leap to um, uh, air source heat pumps and solar panels, but we might not have the ability, we might not have the budget. So we need to look at lots of different opportunities. Okay, cool. Should we move to number three, please? Billy? Does your organization have a target for, science, uh, for carbon reduction? And you've got a few uh, options here. So I'll just talk you through. Do you have a science-based target at one and a half degrees? Or do you have a science-based target at the well below two degree scenario? You might have your own net zero target. And then there's some in development, not sure, no. Super. Okay, so most of you have got something now or it's in development, that's really good. And there's no right or wrong in this. Having It's about having a target and working towards that and, and amending it as you go through as well. So that's really, really good. Okay, so most of you do. Fine, thank you. Uh, question four of five. What are the biggest risks or barriers that your organization is facing pre preventing you from reducing your carbon impacts? Again, this is a word cloud. Excellent, I'm assuming that's capital. So finance basically, cost and finance. Design issues, yes. Getting earlier design engagement, understanding how you can design out carbon from the process. Lack of clarity is an interesting one. I'll maybe uh, get, get my three speakers to talk to that at some point. Clarity of message, clarity of direction and target where we're trying to get to, other than some kind of mythical land of Narnia where there's no carbon at all. Internal friction, I love that phrase. That's great. That's a very PC way of uh, describing those internal issues of getting things over the line. Political support is a similar phrase to that, of course. Size of workforce, yes, that's, that's, that speaks volumes. If you're a small business, uh, the smaller the business, the more hats you wear on an individual per, uh, basis. You know, it's having the right resource of people there to um, support you, deliver what you're looking for. Too many certifications. Yes, there is a bit of a, a confusion about how many labels and standards and certificates you can get on this. Excellent. No, that's really useful. Thank you. Some interesting things there. Um, and then last but not least, question five. So from what you've seen in the news um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, what score out of 10 would you give the negotiators at COP27? 
from where zero is not very good. 10 is amazing. Well done. Have a gold star. Okay, so they're getting five out of 10. They're getting a C plus. They kind of did okay, basically, could have done better. Um, okay, so yeah, I think that that matches my feeling as well. Um, there's lots of issues as well, of course. There's lots of um, uh, complaints that, that the, one of the biggest delegations was from the oil and gas sector. They had well over 600 delegates there um, doing their lobbying. So yeah, some other issues. Great, thanks, Billy. Um, that's really helpful. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move to our first speaker. Um, I'm uh, pleased to say we have got Peter Meesham, uh, Director of Supply Chain Sustainability from uh, Restaurant Brands International. Um, just get the slides up there. Thanks, Billy. Um, who's going to talk us through their perspective on climate change and dealing with carbon. Over to you, Peter. Great. Thank you, James. And, and thank you, Billy, for running the slides. Um, it's great to be with you today to talk about climate action. And I think those answers we saw, the responses we saw in that Mentimeter poll were, were you know, very interesting and hopefully connect with people uh, as we go through this presentation. So, um, Billy, if we can move, move on to uh, the next slide after this. Um, so just to say this information is uh, confidential to RBI, but um, obviously it's you know, free to share with you today. Um, if you jump onto the next slide, Billy. So in terms of uh, the plan for this presentation, I'm quickly just going to explain who we are, who RBI are. Um, then I'll quickly cover what we do, what we do in terms of sustainability at RBI before looking a little bit more closely at our climate action journey in particular. And here I'll, I'll connect it obviously with the, the COP cycle and I can reference where we were at COP26 and, and versus what we've what's what's happened since then. Um, and then I'll just close with a couple of the, the challenges that I see from my perspective in, in supply chain sustainability. Um, so Billy, if you can jump to the next slide, just uh, oh, yeah, one more. The uh, just a quick overview of who we are at Restaurant Brands International. So we're a, um, a multi-brand franchisor in the quick service restaurant industry, um, the QSR industry. We started in um, in 2010 with the acquisition of Burger King, which obviously I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the global um, burger restaurant chain. We then um, acquired Tim Hortons in 2014, which is a Canadian coffee business. Um, which um, any of you who've been to Canada will know is sort of central to Canadian culture. Um, more recently, started the business has started growing in the UK as well. So some of you may be familiar with the, with the business from the UK. Um, then in 2017, we added uh, Popeyes, which is a fried chicken uh, restaurant brand. Um, again, this has started to, to um, kind of be launched in the UK towards the end of last year, and, and we're seeing you know, uh, strong popularity in the UK. And then most recently, we acquired Firehouse Subs, which is a sandwich business, sandwich chain in the US. Um, and again, this is one that we're looking forward to, to rolling out internationally over the coming years. Um, so that's, that's who we are. Then if we look at what we do in terms of sustainability, um, we developed our sustainability strategy, um, as many companies have done, to align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. We split our strategy into three pillars, which cover food, planet, and then people and communities, um, which allows us to work kind of coherently across our three, uh, our four brands, which are each quite different and have quite unique challenges, but we work in a coherent way um, across those brands, uh, addressing the needs and, um, against each of these, these development goals. If we then look in more detail on the next slide at, um, what does that actually mean? How do we translate that, that strategy into, into action, into commitments? We have more than 50 commitments across those three pillars. Um, you can see them all listed here. You probably can't read them. There's a lot of very small text there, but uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at our Restaurant Brands for Good Sustainability Report, which we publish annually. And that has both an overview of all of our commitments as well as our, um, an update on, on the progress we're making. Um, I call out here, you can see um, in the, the dashed dash red box in the middle, um, the first pillar on the planet is climate action, which is obviously the, the kind of the key topic for today. You can see we have a lot of different commitments against climate action. I'll go into those in a little bit more detail in, in the subsequent slides. Um, but 
I think it's um, it's important to call out that for us, this is a, a significant focus of um, of the efforts that my team in particular, but our broader um, sustainability teams at RBI are working on. Okay, so that's an overview of sustainability at RBI. If we now look at our climate action journey, so in this section, I've broken it up into the five steps I would, or what I see as the five kind of discrete steps that we work on through uh, climate action. Um, I'll go over each of these and then uh, as I talk about them, I'll mention when we worked on them and how they fit within the kind of pop cycle. Um, so if we look at step one, the, the first thing we did obviously was to baseline our emissions. So looking at our footprint as an organization, um, we started this in 2019, we collected the data and, and carried out the calculations in 2020 and, and, and um, disclosed how we, were, how we were getting on, as you can see here. So this was in, as I say, 2019-20, so kind of COP25 was, was going on in the background. Um, and this was prior to COP26, obviously we had the, the break in the middle due to COVID. Um, what I'm showing here is the percentage uh, of the emissions under each of these different categories and then obviously split between scope one and two on the left and scope three on the right. Um, the reason I put a dot, dotted line around purchase goods and services, um, purchase goods and services as it's, as it's called under, under the guidance is um, broadly speaking that's supply chain. Um, my role as, as, uh, as I think James mentioned at the start is sub director of supply chain sustainability. For us, supply chain is where we see, you know, across all, a whole variety of our commitments, where we see the, the bulk of our footprint as, a, as an organization, whether that's, you know, animal welfare, packaging, um, or indeed climate action. Um, as you can see here, over 80% of our, our overall emissions as an organization come within our supply chain. So it's a, an area we really have to focus and, and we really have to look to tackle our emissions here, um, which I think looking back at the Mentimeter poll, uh, several of you called out the same challenges, which is which is great to see and and, and you know reinforces my point. Um, so we did this in 2019-20. Then, if we move on to the second step, having having carried out our baseline, we looked we started to set our targets. Um, so when we established our targets, we followed the uh, the science-based targets SBTI um, approach. And we aligned to the 1.5 degree goal, which obviously uh, James has already referenced, um, as well as the 2050 net zero target. What this translates to from a, from a um, you know, if we move from the SBTI kind of framework to what, what do we actually want to achieve against our baseline that we've measured, we want to achieve a 50% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. What this actually means is a 50% reduction in our emissions of under scope one and two, and then a 50% emissions intensity reduction for our scope three emissions. This process of target setting was taking place after we'd carried out our baseline. So it was in 2020, 2021, it, uh, it takes some time to set your target under the SBTI framework. Um, but this was very much during that COP26 uh, cycle, I would say. Um, and so as James mentioned, you know, COP26 was kind of uh, one of the big, the big my big takeaways from it was, uh, you know, this keep 1.5 alive, you know, everyone aligning to this 1.5 target and, and um, you know, there were a lot of organizations and countries kind of committing to it at the time. So we were very much, um, you know, following that trend, if you like, or part of that trend. If we then move on to step three, this is our abatement strategy or our, our emissions reduction strategy. Again, this, this is uh, interesting in connection to the, the Mentimeter poll, which James ran um, at the start of this webinar. So here I'm showing the kind of five different buckets, if you like, that we've broken down our, our uh, strategy into as to how we're going to address uh, climate action for the organization. Um, there's these different actions, are kind of, uh, focused on different scope of emissions, different categories of emissions within our, within our overall business. Um, here I've highlighted our, um, one of the, the, the strategic areas that we're focusing on, which is engaging our supply chain. And, and this incorporates both um, you know, connecting with our supply chain, but also how do we use and utilize and leverage our supply chain to, to reduce our emissions. So it's a bit, more, bit broader than, than just simply engage. And this is where the majority of my focus as the director of supply chain sustainability, um, this is where the majority of my focus is uh, currently. Um, we worked on this abatement strategy throughout 
2021 into 2022. So, um, you know, this has been going on through the COP26 into COP27 cycle. And if we look at um, the next step, which is stages four and five, I've grouped these together because for me, execution and measuring and reporting is ongoing, uh, iterative, and, and they very much run in parallel. Um, I begin, I pull out an extract here from our Restaurant Brands for Good Sustainability Report, uh, which we published earlier this year, and we, we update on an annual basis. I won't ask you to read everything here, it's a lot of text, um, but I wanted to, to kind of explain you know, what we're talking about here. Um, there's two kind of key work streams, although there's three points. The two key work streams are essentially um, providing our, our supplier partners, um, our key stakeholders with, with the tools and the knowledge they need to address supply uh, emissions within their own business and within their own supply chains, because um, you know, we need to leverage network effects to, to uh, ensure that we can deliver against our, our commitments, uh, you know, globally, not just, not just as RBI, but as, 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 the, uh, you know, as a planet. And then uh, the first and the third points here talk about two specific projects that we've recently um, launched, working with uh, some, some um, of our suppliers, but also with key NGOs to try and uh, improve farming practices, to try and work with, um, with ranchers and farmers in, these two are focused in the US, uh, to improve uh, regenerative agriculture um, and to provide you know, knowledge and, and uh, resources to, to those rural communities. Um, I think the reason I highlight this second point is I, one, of the, one of my takeaways from COP27, I know Jane said high level three of the key themes. One of the key themes from, from my perspective for our industry um, was, I believe, a, a, a kind of greater focus on um, partnerships and, and commitment from industry um, to tackle some of these big issues, uh, which I think is a very positive thing. Um, one of the examples of this would be in, on deforestation. We saw a number of major... Um, agribusiness firms and, and food firms coming together to, to commit to tackling deforestation by 2025. Um, some people would say, you know, some of those organizations have delayed their commitments uh, historically and have failed to meet them previously. But I think this is a very positive sign because of the fact that we see these organizations coming together uh, and working in partnership to, to um, achieve those goals. Uh, and I think that's something we're going to see a lot more of going forwards. Um, so then if we move on to look at the challenges ahead, um, I've, I've, these, are, these are just my personal opinion, you know, they're not part of any uh, organizational strategy or, on our behalf, but I, what I wanted to highlight here is a few, thing, a few areas where I see you know, more work is needed and, and you know, some challenges that, that my team are certainly thinking about. Um, the first one is global engagement. Um, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to work in a global supply chain, interacting with partners um, across you know, all, all different geographies. Um, but I certainly see that the engagement in uh, you know, tackling the climate crisis is, is different in different regions. Um, you know, different, different countries have felt the effects differently. Different countries have, different, uh, have either allocated more or less resources to this problem based on their you know, conflicting demands. Um, I think going forwards, we'll need to find ways to, to create partnership and work together to solve this problem. Um, impact measurement, I think increasingly we're, you know, we're seeing that consumers, but also organizations are interested in making better decisions and how, how in, uh, in regards to supply and in regards to the products they consume. But um, to make better decisions, you need more accurate measurements of the footprint of the products you're buying or the services you're using. Um, you know, today we use a lot of historically calculated emissions factors based on, um, you know, industry level, sector level, country level, region level uh, uh, emissions inventories. Going forwards, we need to find ways through technology to improve that, I think, in order to help us make better decisions. The third point is traceability. I think, um, you know, we can all only do the right thing if we know what we're buying, we know where it's come from, we're sure that it's been you know, track throughout the full supply chain, and we can therefore, um, you know, take advantage of, of the improvements in, in uh, farming and impact measurements and in, in the quality of the products that we were buying. And then the final one is accelerating innovation. And here, um, given my perspective and my focus on the food industry, 
I think it's really interesting to, to bear in mind, you know, we're in December, we're coming towards the end of 2022. Um, if we think in agricultural terms, you know, to hit our 20, 2030 target, we have seven cropping cycles yet left for the majority of major um, you know, agricultural commodities. If we look at um, cattle in particular and, and the beef industry, we have probably four calving cycles left. Um, so really we need to accelerate innovation. We need to make change quickly. We need to be doing the research today in order to make the most of the time that we do have um, in the run up to 2030. So action is needed now. Great, so that, that was it from me. Um, thank you very much everyone for, for joining today and thank you for, to James and, and Billy for putting this on. Thank you, Beta. That was um, really interesting. And that, that final stat there really came home to me. Seven cropping cycles and four calving cycles. These are numbers you can count on one or two hands. Um, 2030 still sounds quite far away to many people, but it um, it's, not in, it's not in your world. Um, <laughs> indeed, uh, wonderful. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Um, I'm now, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Matthew Adams, Assistant Director for Climate Change and Natural Resources at Harrow Council, who's going to give us um, the local authority perspective on how we tackle this um, at, a, at an authority level. Over to you, Matthew. Right, we can see your screen. You're on mute, by the way, Matthew. There we go. You can hear me now. Good. Uh, Good. Can you see the screen? Okay. I'll just can, make, yes. make it a little bit bigger from into, into slideshow mode as well. There we go. Is that okay, James? <clears throat> yeah, that's just coming through. Okay, well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I'm Matthew Adams. I'm uh, one of the assistant directors at uh, Harrow Council, which for those of you who may not know, is a, a small, um, uh, smallish borough in northwest London. Uh, and I was going to give a little bit of perspective uh, on the local authority scene in London. Um, there's a lot going on, and I, uh, I can obviously only speak for Harrow. Uh, from direct experience but uh, we are involved as well in some other sort of regional West London collaborations and also a couple of Pan London projects so um, give you a little bit of a scene set on that I thought it would be helpful as well just to talk a little bit about consumption emissions because that's also been touched upon by Peter not really on on uh, local authorities radar initially I don't think after climate emergency declarations were made but then gradually becoming obviously more and more important because um, you know, significant amount of emissions are in, in our supply chains and uh, uh, in the, the goods and services that we consume. So give you a little bit of a feel for London. There's Harrow up in the, the top left hand corner there. Um, 32 London boroughs plus the city of London. The vast majority of them declare climate emergencies in uh, 2019 on the back of the um, IPCC report. Then. Sorry to interrupt Matthew, we can't, we can see your slides but they're kind of hanging, they're not moving. Hang on. So is we can that, see the we can see the front screen, the one with the the chart ah, holding the the. Has that not, it hasn't moved to the map. Okay. No. Hang on a moment. Maybe if you stop sharing and then reshare. Maybe if I move it along that way, is that better? No, that's just gone blank from what we're seeing at the moment. Ah, that's a little odd. Ah, okay, so yes, I can see your cursor now. So if you maybe just go into uh, slideshow. There we go. Let's try it. Yeah. And then see if we can move them along that way. <clears throat> can you see that now? It's it's thinking. <laughs> yeah, yes, it's just we're seeing your notes screen rather than the uh, okay. The presentation. Uh, does Billy want to share his? Because it might yeah. be. And then we can. That, that would on. work fine. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. So if you want to do that, so Billy, if you want to share up the deck, that'd be great. While while, while Billy's Bill is doing that, um, just to talk talk you through that map which you briefly saw, um, there are um, yeah thirty London boroughs plus City of London. The vast majority have a twenty thirty organisational target, um, and. That was a you know a, a political declaration in 2019, um, but it's also now backed up by um, the Mayor of London, who has a, a 2030 target. Uh, it, it's challenging, but for organisations, not unachievable. Um, obviously, as well as our own organisations, which is substantial, we also have responsibility for our local areas. Um, I don't know that Billy can bring up the slides for the I'll, next. I'll, I'll get them up. It's okay. There, there you go. go. Can you see those? That's it. If you move on to the next one. 
thanks james so uh that's the um the, the area targets um some of us have 20 30 targets uh, to be honest um that's going to be extremely challenging uh, it's an ambition at the moment but net zero by 2030 across the whole of london clearly is is probably going to be beyond our reach but it doesn't mean that we can't set the ambition high the mayor has a 2030 target but the recent adopted um accelerated green pathway he calls it um, delivers actually 22 percent residual emissions by 2030 and even that is extremely challenging uh it includes some unpopular measures like those of you who, who live in london will be well aware probably of the um the ules expansion um but uh you know that's the sort of level of of um of intervention that's going to be required to to get close to uh net zero or at least a significant uh, reduction in emissions in that case from um from road transport by 2030. Uh, next slide please james so just to give you a little bit of context with a few numbers coming up uh, this is a ton of co2 you may have seen this before it's a sphere 10 meters by 10 meters in, in diameter and in my mind it helps to um just to think of these little balloons that we're all carrying and a uh, significant number of those each personally but also as organizations uh, as as boroughs and of course uh, in, nationally and internationally as well and when you start to visualize it that way you can just see that the, the, the amount of co2 that's still in production at the moment uh, next slide please so um probably aware of the three categories of, of emissions measurement that that traditionally um have been undertaken scope one scope two and scope three so scope one are direct emissions and for local authorities this is um our our vehicles as authorities uh, our heating requirements from quite a big estate we all have schools and various other public buildings under under our control um, and thinking about the borough as a whole it's obviously the borough's buildings and um uh, and road transport uh, within the borough so to give you an idea harris emissions are around 450,000 tons of co2 a year the focus areas for local authorities have been very much initially i think we're on this area looking at how we can retrofit um, schools and public buildings. Harrow is just finishing, as an example, a, a 4.5 million phase one retrofit program for seven schools and public buildings. It involves putting heat pumps in to replace or supplement gas boilers. Uh, really good, uh, but difficult process. Um, if you uh, have seen industrial size heat pumps, they are huge things. They sit outside schools, quite invasive. Um, uh, technology to, to also improve the fabric of these, these schools and public buildings, which of course can't close for a year or a year at a time to, to do this work. So it is a challenging exercise, but um, uh, it, it is possible. And it, it, the skills and the knowledge around that, I think, gradually growing in local authorities as they are in, in other industries. Fleet decarbonisation, doing quite a bit of work on, on that. Um, a longer term plan problem we have at the moment with that is is the heavy vehicles even minibuses of the size we need aren't yet available as electric uh, alternatives or if they are available they are extremely expensive uh, magnitude of two three four times more expensive than than diesel versions um but that that's a, a long term prospect um the market is changing um low carbon transport how do we reduce fossil uh, fuel journeys in the borough uh, things like electric charging infrastructure is important uh, for that, uh, public infrastructure charging, encouraging private infrastructure charging, um, and ways incentivizing uh, active travel as well. Indirect emissions, uh, uh, roughly half the direct emissions total. I won't go into too much detail on that. The ma main thing to say is that solar PV is probably the most active way we can we can reduce those emissions by generating electricity locally in london there's a, a scheme if you've lived in london you, you may have received letters about this called solar together london which is a group buying scheme we sponsored in harrow along with lots of other boroughs to enable residents to acquire solar panels at a, a, a lower rate than they would have done if they did them individually we can also move to green tariffs uh, the mayor has a scheme called london power which is a, a sort of renewable back tariff and then the last category, if you click once more, James, is um, scope three. And the reason these are in red, consumption emissions, is they are difficult to measure, um, as we all know, uh, but a really important category. And I'll talk in a moment about the public procurement project we've done in West London. Uh, and it, once you start to measure consumption emissions, you start to also see the impact of food and diet choice on, on emissions reduction. If you move to the next slide, James, please. 
uh, always quickly, I thought I'd show you this. This is our electric sweeper in Harrow. Um, uh, I was talking to the gentleman last week who drives it. He's like the cat, he's got the cream. He's uh, there polishing it every day. Uh, feels, uh, there's, there's four other sweepers at all diesel. I think he feels very much in a privileged position. Uh, interesting thing about that is it is a lot more expensive. We only did one out of the four because we couldn't afford the four, but um, there are other benefits uh, in terms of running costs uh, before the current electrical increase uh, of rates, but there, it is still slightly cheaper than diesel. And uh, you can also run them because they're quieter at different hours. So, you know, the same with strimmers and leaf blowers and other equipment that local authorities use. You can, you can, there's, there's co-benefits beyond the decarbonisation as well. Next slide, please. Just briefly to say there are seven climate programmes across London, uh, uh, which all boroughs are involved in, and they're led by individual boroughs. You can see there they cover things like retrofit, using the planning system, uh, transport, renewable energy. Uh, the programme Harrow is leading, which is to do with consumption emissions. I won't go into too much detail, but happy to take questions on that later. Uh, a green economy programme and a resilient and green programme from Southwark, which is, is around climate adaptation, uh, primarily in mitigation. Next slide, please. So I mentioned measuring consumption emissions and how that can give you a different perspective. So um, if you totted up Harrow's scope one and scope two emissions in the previous slides, you see they came to about 650,000 tonnes. But when you start to measure true cost of consumption, so that's the emissions embedded in goods and services outside our physical area, which of course is transport, flights, travel outside the area, most of the food, uh, and goods that we buy uh, are produced outside London, often abroad, then you get a much more holistic uh, position around emissions. And this gives you a quick summary of that, about 8.6 tonnes per resident in Harrow, uh, uh, 8.6 of those balloons per person being let off for every year into the sky, and there's 250,000 uh, residents. So you get a figure well over 2 million tonnes uh, for the borough as a whole. Also gives prominence then to transport, which um, once you measure the whole picture becomes the single most um, uh, highest area of emissions. That's the blue segment there. The red segment is um, is houses and um, uh, physical buildings, you know, mainly heating and power. And then the, the third category really to mention is food. So that's really the green and the and the purple segments there, over a ton of CO two per person. And actually for all of us, um, this is going to be a focus of a campaign next year, Pan London, the biggest thing we can do individually right now is, is to reduce our food emissions, change our diet. Um, we can make a big difference if we uh, collectively start to reduce dairy and meat. Next page. Um, I, I dug this figure out, interestingly, sort of almost supported by Peter's, um, uh, Peter's own figure for his organisation. Uh, for most of us, local authorities probably won't be much different. Um, uh, consumption emissions in our supply chain exceed our scope one and scope two by you know, a factor of four or five. Um, so on the back of that, and if you just move to the next slide, James, my last one, um, recognising this, we, we ran a project in West London, uh, which James was an integral part, part of, and we worked very closely with him over a six to 12 month period to develop a low carbon procurement toolkit for, um, for West London. Uh, we had eight boroughs participating, which is, uh, was, was fantastic. We all had the same needs. We weren't really testing carbon through our procurement processes. So uh, we've developed a, a toolkit that all of our officers can use in major procurements to uh, start uh, this dialogue really with our suppliers. And it's been a really positive process with, for those of us who have, have done it with suppliers, the vast majority of them want to do good things in this area. Uh, this is an end to those conversations. What are the opportunities? Um, so that's been rolled out this year. Uh, if you're contracting with West London authorities, you'll probably start to see these questions uh, coming through during the procurement process. And uh, it's a learning process for all of us, but uh, I think a really positive, positive step. So that's the end of my presentation um happy to take any any, any questions uh, at the end if there's anything that you've uh, yeah, if you've interested you out of that thank you super thank you very much matthew you know really interesting uh, presentation there there's just a, a, a couple of observations i've made um some notes on as you as you're talking um we've got a lot of the technology already available whether it's electric vehicles or solar panels but one of the things that we need as society is the infrastructure to go with it 
it's all very well having an electric vehicle, but if there's nowhere to charge it up or nowhere convenient to charge it up, um, it causes a block. Um, but we still need innovation. There's still a, there's still room for innovation, whether that's at the heavier end of vehicles or different ways of working. There's lots of opportunities. Um, and I love that final stat there, the 5.1, 5.5 to 1 ratio that, that, that chimes with what I see there. Some organizations out there, barely 1 or 2% of their overall impact is their direct footprint. The vast majority is in their supply chain. So uh, really great stuff. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our uh, third and final speaker. Um, last but not least, we've got C. Kumar from um, NSG, Nippon Sheet Glass Group, Sustainability and Climate Change Technical Manager. Um, over to you, Z. Thanks, James. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, yeah, we can see that. We just need to go to slideshow. Super. Is that okay? Yeah, we're seeing your notes screen rather than your... Oh, uh, yeah, you can just switch screens. That's it. Yeah. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So, hi, guys. Um, I'm Z Zishan Kumar. I'm, I work at NSG Pilkington. Uh, we're the one of the largest glass manufacturing black glass manufacturing companies in the world. And uh, I work in the sustainability and climate change function, man function, managing the sustainability activities, climate change activities and energy management um, across all of our sites. Just to give you a little bit of um, a background of NSG, um, we supply um, architectural and automotive glass globally and promote and shift to higher added value. We also have a third business unit, which is the uh, technical glass, so products which include thin glass for displays, lenses, popular printers uh, and scanners, and specialty glass fibre products as well. So uh, one of the, uh, we have the biggest market share in the glass cord business, so glass cord is, goes into your engine timing belts. Um, we have a facility in Japan and in St. Helens in the UK that has been manufacturing this for over 45 years. Um, but the biggest bulk of our um, revenue comes from the automotive and architectural, as you can see in the in the chart on the in the bottom right. Um, we're based all over the world. We have uh, twenty eight float lines worldwide. So float lines are where the architectural glass, black glass, is 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 made. Um, we have uh, twenty six thousand employees globally as well. Uh, we started in 1918, NSG as, as a group started in 1918. Pilkington was actually founded in, in St. Helens, uh, UK, but um, it was the, the acquisition in 2006 of Pilkington, um, you know, was the game changer for NSG group. Um, you know, from 1918, they developed various sites, which we have up to now in China, Vietnam, um, in Japan mainly as well. But... We became the global leader in flat glass in 2006 with the acquisition of uh, Pilkington Glass. And um, up to till now, we announced our, our vision and our medium term vision and a medium term plan, revival plan 24, what we call. Um, so, yeah, uh, just some examples of some architectural products that we, we have. We're, um, the only site, the only place we don't have any sites at the moment is Africa and Middle East. Uh, in the Middle East part, but in Europe, South America, Far East Asia, um, South America, North America, we we have our, our sites um, doing various, doing these, providing these wonderful products um, across the three business units. We have a lot of um, interaction with large, you know, the the, the best car manufacturers, the, the biggest car manufacturers in the world, um, developing windshields, heads up displays. Um we do like solar, uh, the uh, panoramic roof and uh, just continuously developing basically uh, new technologies and, the, you know, the, the glass as well for architectural. So we just um, during COVID, we in, invented a glass, uh, which was the first uh, glass to have um, a, a viral a, a coating on it that would prevent viral tran um, transmissions from happening, which went down really well. Uh, to prevent the spread of the viruses such as, such as COVID-19. And uh, we also have developed a, a, a glass for birds. Um, it's called Avisafe. So birds that fly um, where they, you know, don't basically crash into the into 
into the windows, uh, which which has gone down really well as well for lots of um, construction companies as well. Um, and then technical glass, as I said, uh, we do makeup products. Um, funnily enough, in in makeup, you will see Metashire, which is glass plates, which we produce, and for print printer um, lens as well, and the glass cord, which I talked to you about. In terms of um, roadmap to carbon neutrality uh, for 2050, the group recognises that uh, the environmental problem, including climate change, is one of the most important issues that we need to address. So the group has committed to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. We want to be net zero by 2050. But to be more challenging and competitive, we actually raised our carbon reduction target for the 2030 targets that we had from 21% to 30% <coughs> compared to 2018. Sorry about my voice, by the way. It's, uh, I've just developed a little cold yesterday, so better than yesterday. So um, I'll, um, yeah, it's because of that, basically. Um, and so, yeah, ra we raised our carbon reduction target from 21% to 30% want to be more to make us more challenging with our targets to push us um, to push the governments to push the different regions to achieve these targets towards the decarbonization projects which i'll touch on that we we've got ourselves involved in but also to match competitor ambition as well to um to match you know the things that have been talked about in cop 25 26 20 um, and in cop 27 and we have we want to get to that to 1.5 degree scenario we want to try our best to do as an industry the glass industry is one of the most carbon intensive industries but at the same time glass can be infinitely recycled now for these targets the group will continue not only existing technology improvement but also disruptive innovation such as optimization of glass production processes including improvement of furnace energy efficiency increased proportion of alternative fuel or renewable energy and supply chain development as well so as you can see from the from from the graph, the the existing technology act with a 2018 baseline and where we are with 21 percent, uh, 2021. Sorry, we've got scope one is improvement of our furnaces. So furn our furnaces is our biggest carbon intensive um, pr process. If we can do what we, you know, like look at alternative fuels. So currently our fuel furnaces are fueled by um, a natural gas or fuel oil, very carbon intensive. We're looking at alternative fuels such as bio oils or hydrogen or even electric melting. Now electric melting would be absolutely amazing to, 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 to do all of our furnaces to be powered by green electricity coming in 100% renewable and um the, the the melting occurs um through this through pure electric uh, pure electricity scope two is our increase in proportion of renewable energy now our scope one and two targets of 30 percent by 2030 scope one is the challenge for us scope three with the supply supply chain development which i'll touch on is is the challenge scope two however our procurement team work hard and work uh, very diligently to I think we will ex way well exceed that 30% target for scope two. Um, we're looking at regions of 85% by 2030 to have our targets have been set that we want to have renewable electricity um, in our sites in various regions. Now that can be through green tariffs like geos, VPPA, uh, VPPAs. Um, we kind of got lucky with the Poland PPA that we signed up for um, at the right time before the energy crisis. So we've saved millions from, from just doing that. Um, so we can see the benefits of having that. Um, and by carbon neutral, by, by 2050, we want to be carbon neutral. We want zero carbon fuel, carbon capture storage, very expensive, but very it will be very uh, beneficial to us and alternative, alternative materials as well. Then we've got a roadmap as well. So we developed this roadmap, which shows in step one. So effective dissemination of energy and carbon dioxide efficiency measures across all group operations. So the activities we want to include in here are infrastructure upgrades, waste, uh, uh, glass, which we call cullet management. Problem with cullet is, you know, when we have a demolition of, of site um, of a building, the glass that 
uh, you know, is is cracked and is is breaks into smithereens. It, it's probably contaminated. Now we don't have technologies at the moment to to clean that glass. We we can send it out to do it, and um, it's long winded. But then the risk of interrupting that glass back into our process and mixed with our newly freshly made glass is the challenge. Um, now we are pushing our sites to take that risk. However, it's a cost versus benefit um, situation. But the the quicker we can push collect, um, as I said, glass being infinitely recycled, if we can push collect more and more, that is where we will reach our reach these targets of ours. Because we're not, we we can reduce our scope one emissions because we're not having to use a lot of our raw materials as well as our scope three emissions as well. Then step two is renewable energy, like I said, so procurement of um, generation renewable energy activities, which include PPAs um, on site generation. Um, and then we look at step three, technology change. So this is technologies that we need to involve in, in bring in. So we have roadmaps uh, site by site, decarbonisation roadmaps, where we want to um, start um, involving new technology, so low carbon fuels, um, electrification, carbon capture, etc. Um, and step four is the the value of the uh, value chain engagement, which is understanding and reducing our scope three emissions. So, you know, data data is key for us, but data transparency, data accuracy is what we need to work on and work with our suppliers. And step five is carbon offsets, the final step to achieve carbon neutrality. We can be carbon neutral tomorrow if we wanted to, but carbon offsets is not the, is not our answer. We want to work with suppliers, work with our teams, work with our research development uh, groups that we have across the world um, to develop these new technologies and push these decarbonisation projects as much as we can. Okay, so one of the first which you might have seen in the press, especially here in the UK, is um, at our um, facility in St. Helens, we were the first uh, flow glass production um, site to produce glass from fully um, uh, fueled by hydrogen. Now, you can see we we actually did various compositions, so it was 100% hydrogen, then 90, 10, and various ratios. And if you look at this video, which I will play and hopefully you can see, you can see the natural gas on the left hand side and hydrogen on the on the right. So you'll and and the glass batches is, is is at the bottom. Sorry, it's probably a bit slow and keeps getting stuck, but uh, but yeah, you can you can understand the gist of it is. Uh, this is this is what we what we did. Um, we did this in partnership with Hynet. So thank you to Hynet for for supporting us us with this. Um, and it went down really well, to be honest. And we were the first float line to use hydrogen as a fuel, and we're very proud of that. And it is one of the options we will consider, depending on the infrastructure that um, it gets developed, especially in the northwest region. Um, in the UK, so one of the other first, okay, there we go. One of the other firsts that we achieved um, in this year, in February this year, was producing glass from 100% biofuel. Now, 100% biofuel with um, no real scope one emissions, mainly just scope three emissions associated with it, but considerably lower. So 40% reduction in overall carbon footprint of the glass was produced from what we normally would produce with the non-renewable fuels that fuel our furnace. However, there are um, lots of technical challenges that we need to overcome in terms of commercial and logistics. Um, but we were the lowest car, it's the lowest carbon float glass that was ever produced in the world. And again, we're very um this was done over a span of three days and we are very proud of what we produced and it's it's as you can imagine it's really good to to sell this to customers to um for them to then promote their um decarbonization strategies as well and plans and they could use our glass to 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 promote that so in terms of our challenges to get to net zero and um, COP, mission, COP ambitions for support. 
we as MSG Pilkerton have a defined strategy to deliver ESG objectives, uh, which is fully integrated to the group strategy. We have carbon dioxide emissions targets, CO2 emission targets that have been redefined. Um, so like I said, change from 21% to, 20, uh, to 30% by 2030 to align with stakeholder expectations. We're openness, openness, uh, we have an openness to collaboration and we believe that is key. Um, so not so long ago, I was in Sorrento for the Soda Ash conference. Soda Ash is one of the biggest raw materials we use in our architectural process. Now we are, if we if we can push the suppliers that we work with, or even new ones that we want to go to, as as an example with Soda Ash, if they can reduce their scope one emissions by fifty percent, that's a considerable amount of scope emissions for uh, for our scope three emissions that will be re reduced from from them working with them to do that. And it was a great conference to attend and see what the what the suppliers are doing so that they can reduce their uh, to see their decarbonization strategies basically to um because we, we recognize we don't have all the answers but we are working proactively to find them we are working with the right people the right forum we weren't getting involved in the right forums um and it's great to be part of this one as well and to understand how different um industries are working so it's good to see for, um the from from a council point of view there the, how they work from a food um, perspective as well, how they work, and then you've got us in a in a very carbon intensive industry, and you see our challenges. Um, but we 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 are willing to collaborate with 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 everyone and work together. Um, so current energy crisis means investment on decarbonisation projects is under pressure. So you can just imagine what we forecasted. I mean, we were more clever about it this year, but last year when we just had the hike of the energy prices, especially in Europe, that hit us big time. Like um, we had to hold off some projects, we had to cancel some projects, uh, whether that be decarbonization or just energy or, con or continuous improvement projects um, because of the, the investment that needed to go into the energy, energy prices. In terms of COP, so COP delegations can support by funding some of our projects in regions where the decarbonisation activities are slow currently. So in Far East Asia and North America, um, we can work with the local governments, uh, the government, the councils um, to support our sites to, to, to be decarbonised and uh, look at projects. Um, so we believe COP delegations could, could help us with that. NSG products can actually support COP emissions as we're working hard to make our products as carbon neutral as we can, um, as well as making them more energy efficient as well. And one, one other thing that I uh, would like to touch on is clearer guidelines and policy on accounting of carbon benefit in use versus embodied carbon would be welcome as well. How about a scope four? So what would a scope four look like? Uh, we work hard on one, two and three. You know, is that something we can touch on in COP28? Just a thought. So that's it, it, all from me. Uh, thank you, James. Great. Thanks, Zay. Thank you very much for that. Really interesting. Just some uh, comments <coughs> back from me or some, some notes I've made. It's really interesting to see the carbon hierarchy displayed. You had the, the slide with the roadmap on it and all the different things you're going to do. Looks really good, and for me, that's that's really the carbon hierarchy. It's about reducing your own emissions from the beginning. Yeah, that one about your operational efficiency, looking at your energy sources, different technologies and innovations, and then only when we've done all these things can we look at offsets, or should we look yeah. at offsets? Um, no, really powerful message, and I love the the piece about switching trialing and switching to hydrogen gas. Um, there's lots of uh, energy intensive uh, industries and sectors out there who have have got a big demand for. Uh, for power for energy um so moving over to something cleaner progressively over time of course we do realize yeah. that there's um you know technological change and you want to make sure it works and it's obviously price conscious as well um is really important but no some really powerful stuff there um wonderful thanks e um if i could ask my other two speakers to pop their microphones on um and cameras on that'd be great um and see if you're happy to stop sharing your slides, that'd be great. We can move into some um, Q and A. Uh, <laughs> uh, there should be at the top, oh. there should be a red. Pause share, it says pause share. Oh, there we go, stop share. 
wonderful thank you great so yeah thank you to my three speakers some really interesting and very different uh, presentations uh, from different sectors uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in i'm going to start off with one that was from alice which uh, is similar to um, another one that i've got here that um it's based on some of those statistics so matthew put up that stat that uh, on average um about 85 percent of your footprint is in your scope three in your supply chain depends on which sector you're in obviously nsg it's slightly different but even there you've still got about 50 percent of your overall impact in scope three supply chain um and it will vary depending on where you sit in that value chain so my question is uh similar to, to alice's how do we encourage our suppliers and our supply chain partners to reduce carbon how do we engage with them beyond just please reduce your carbon. What are, what are the, the tactics that we use? What are the conversations we have um, in, in getting them to engage and think about what they can do? So Peter, if I could come to you first with that question from RBI's perspective, and then I'll, I'll go around the group. Certainly, um, and I think it's a very uh, you know, pressing issue and something that I, I spend a lot of time thinking about as well. Um, obviously there's different mechanisms, I think there's, you know, the first mechanism that we we focused on is sharing information, helping our suppliers understand the need for change, um, helping our suppliers have access to the resources they need to to you know, understand emissions within their own business and what they can do to reduce them. Um, and then beyond that, you know, there's the opportunity we have the opportunity to offer you know premiums to suppliers who are able to demonstrate that their products or their what their services or you know the things they're supplying to us are better than today better than the standard better than the average um that's always a more complicated discussion you know it's a commercial discussion it's it's important to you know balance between between the, the cost you're paying and and the impact you're having and try and find the most efficient ways to have the biggest impact um but yeah for me i think that the number one step is sharing knowledge sharing information um, letting people understand the problem, and then you know beyond that, it becomes a commercial commercial challenge. You're on mute, James. Sorry. Ball error. Um, yeah, Matthew, from your perspective, from the local authority point of view, how you'd engage suppliers and contractors? Uh, how 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 do we bring them on side? <clears throat> I think you start, I start from the point most people want to do the right thing, and I think I think that's true. I think um, most businesses now are looking at what they can do in this sphere. I, I just say, as a local authority, our, our expectations are quite different depending on the type of contractor. So, you know, most local authorities will have um, and want to encourage uh, contractors from the local area, some of whom are quite small organisations, and um, our expectations around that will be quite different to. You know, a weights or a, a, a big building company, for example. Um, one of the ways we have done it when we rolled out the toolkit, and James was you were involved in this, was to, to make it very clear as a group that we wanted to do uh, an SME training session. So we we invited all our SMEs across those eight boroughs to attend a training session to um, to learn practically what does this mean for you. Um, you may not have an ESG department. You may not have. Uh, you know, the access to consultants, etc. But there are practical things you can do as a small business um, uh, that, that will make a difference. You know, even it's thinking about how do your staff get around when they're, they're, they're performing their services? Uh, where are you buying electricity from? You know, can you put solar panels on your on your office roof? Whatever it is, small things can make a big difference. So I think that's the starting point that you've got to have the dialogue with, with the suppliers um, and, and it will be horses for courses. Um, we're not expecting the world from, from small businesses at the moment. Yeah. Z, have you got anything you'd like to build on that? I, I very much get Matthew's point that it's it's that dialogue, it's that communication. Anything from your experience to build on that? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, the, uh, Peter and Matthew are completely right about communication is is key. Um, you know, giving that example from my presentation about the Sodash um, conference, which I attended, the, seeing the suppliers, I think for them, doing that right thing of having that competitive advantage over their competitors, um, they are looking to decarbonize decarbonization roadmaps strategies to give them that competitive advantage over um their their competitors and that will they believe will attract us as their customers or other cost, potential customers industries to come come to to them so i, I think 
doing that right thing, communicating, uh, and just giving them them that push is, is the most important thing in, in this. Yeah, I, I would agree. A lot of the times when we support uh, particularly smaller organisations, they kind of, they look a, a little bit like a rabbit caught in the headlights. Where do we start? We haven't got the resources, <coughs> budget, budget as well. So if we can give them some support and knowledge on, you know, anything is better than nothing, essentially, making that journey. Okay, super, thank you. Um, we've got a question which was directed at Peter, but I'm going to open it up more widely because it is relevant to all of you. It's about the, the demand for resources and raw materials. How do we balance the need for growing businesses, growing populations, um, and the resources and raw materials that we require for that? How do we, how do we keep that sustainable in the widest sense of the word? So, Peter, I'll come to you first on that one, if I may. I think this is one of the... Um one of the most interesting concepts if you like within within the kind of sphere of sustainability you know uh, particularly from an agricultural commodities perspective um you know the drive on the one hand you have the drive to to uh, use less land use less space which is extremely important to to you know to avoid deforestation and damage to the environment and and the negative impacts of that in biodiversity and emissions but on the other hand, um, you know, we have the need to ensure the welfare of animals and the need to, you know, ensure that we're using the best farming practice possible, often which leads to an increase in demand and increase in space required. Um, you know, ultimately more efficient farming methods is, is what it all comes down to, finding solutions where we can maximize production while minimizing the resources required. Um, it's it's a it's a big challenge i don't have the solution to this it's it's very tough and it's something that we come up against in in all of the decisions we're making you know from a procurement perspective within the food industry um but you know it's something that a lot of good work is being done on i would say um a lot of a lot of firms are working very hard on this a lot of people are working very hard on this um and i think we are seeing significant improvements potentially in the future we'll see precision fermentation we'll see you know the use of um alternative alternative forms of protein um as a as solutions to try and improve in, in this area um but some of those solutions are, are not quite ready yet for, for wider use great no thank you peter and, and the word you're you're implying there without saying it is innovation and we still need that we still do yeah definitely um you know i i think one of my most trotted out sentences is we have a lot of the technology already but we don't have everything at our fingertips yet so yeah. um great thank you uh, z from your point of view in your presentation you talked a lot about using recycled glass using cullet essentially um from your perspective you know yeah glass is infinitely recyclable but is there a supply and demand uh, issue there for you in terms of getting enough color in uh, could you ever see a world where you're using 100 cullet rather than you know taking raw materials or where do you see the balance going over the next five years? Yeah, uh, yeah, James, um, I think seeing 100% colour, I, I don't think we will get there probably in the next 10 years. I, I don't think um, unless it, it's just the, the 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 logistic issues that we have of getting our, the glass returned and the cleaning side of things, ensuring it's not, the, you know, the lamination that happens on the glass. Um, to ensure the contamination isn't isn't there, um, and then the problems of the risk of mi mixing it with with the with the current new glass being produced, um, that's the, the the real risk for us at the moment. We know our competitors are, are taking that risk and doing that, um, but we just can't afford to do that at the moment with the current um, uh, and economy, um, especially in in Europe. Um, so yeah, in in that sense, I, it would be ideal to have a facility on site where we can, you know, we do have a lot of waste of our own glass that we produce on our site, um, but just continuously, you know, cleaning using that um, and then bringing it in from working with small SMEs um, if they can provide us something or working with collaboration with competitors, working with them. We have sites in uh, Brazil where we are actually got a 50% partnership with our competitor, um, a joint venture that we that we have with them, where we are producing, you know, tons and tons of glass, um, which is profitable for our business. So why can't we do something together for the better of our uh, for the better of our world? Yeah, 
I think yeah, there's some good, good things I, li I like it in, in your response there, Z, about um, about collaboration. You know, I've heard lots of people talking lately that sustainability should not be a point of competition in the way that safety um, used to be, but isn't anymore. We just assume that people are going to be safe. Uh, we're going to send people home alive, fit and well at the end of a working day. It's not a point of competition that sustainability should be getting towards that as well, that we should, where possible, collaborate with our with our peers. Um, in our in within and outside of our sector um no really key um <clears throat> and there's also something else in there which I'll, I'll kind of spin the question slightly around to matthew's point of view in terms of the behavioral piece something that z was mentioning there was about you know we can separate these products to to avoid contamination but it's about around the systems and the behaviors that need to be improved potentially so that we don't get that contamination in in the in the world of glass how do you see that playing out in your world, Matthew, in terms of the behavioural piece, uh, the, the, the people piece, rather than you know the machine or the, the material? Yes, yeah, so, so I suppose in, the, in that chain, we're right at the end as local authorities. Um, you know, local authorities collect the rubbish and they get rid of it, and um, and that's a big part of um, our operations. It's a big part of our expenditure, public funds on that. Um, I think things are changing. We're, we're starting to see a little bit of a focus more on, on food waste, separating out food waste, and then just reducing it. Um, so it's not in residual, and, and then the, 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 what, it, what is separated is uh, is reduced. And at the moment, that does go to, to biodigesting facilities and things like that, and creates energy. But obviously, it's energy ultimately that we you know we don't we want don't want the demand there. We want less food waste. Um, we're seeing that the Environment Act is coming in, which some of you will be aware of, which has a range of responsibilities for local authorities around increasing separation. Um, at the moment, there's a patchwork of stuff happening even around London different collection regimes and uh, as you'll probably know your authority is probably different from the next one so I think the standardization of that will, will really help matters as well and then the last thing is probably around extended producer responsibility ultimately we need to get to this position where where goods aren't throwaway goods and and they are, are designed for disassembly um, in some cases their packaging etc is taken back by manufacturers and reused and then I think gradually we'll reduce that, that 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 problem end of end of life problem we're dealing with as local authorities. Super. No, I, I, I'd agree 100% on that. And for me, what what I take away from that is that this is not just about climate change. This is circular economy. This is uh, social value in local communities, whether it's suppliers or um, providers, contractors, that kind of thing. So a lot of these things come together, and they're not discrete um, islands that we need to address. Okay. Um, one question here, again, this one's aimed at Z, but I'm going to kind of um, throw it out to all of you in terms of the offsetting point. So Z very uh, cleverly described that that roadmap of, you know, the things that they need to do at NSG and are doing to reduce emissions, but offsetting being um, at the end of the road. Uh, the question is, is there ever a limit on how much we can offset? Is there a bar beneath which we need to get? Um, Z, I'll start with you because you, you, you um, put up that wonderful graphic of the roadmap. Um, is there a limit? Um, no, there's, there's, as I said, we can be carbon neutral tomorrow if we wanted to, as you know, we, we to, if we, if, you know, we just put all of our money into carbon offsets and, and do these things, but we actually want to push ourselves to, to look at new technologies, to implement new infrastructure upgrades and, um look at PPP, PPAs, um, et cetera. I mean, for our scope too, as an example, like I said, the Poland one, Poland, you know, chance for us was amazing last year where we signed a virtual VPPA that saved us millions and millions of euros. Um, had we not have done that, you know, we we because of the high energy prices all of a sudden in Europe, we would have struggled. Um, and that's something that we're very proud of. So um there's there's no real limit to answer your question but um we we, we ideally want don't want to go go to carbon offsets that's yeah. that's the bottom line super thanks Lee. peter from from rbi's perspective um yeah so I, i'd say one one sort of interesting point the the sbti and um system of of corporate targets or you know, commitment to to climate targets under their under the way that's structured for the 2030 targets you're not actually allowed to use offsets um, against your emissions so after our 50 percent emissions reduction we do have to uh, you know 
achieve that outright. That can't be through through offsets. Uh, under the the net zero targets for 2050, there is a, a, an allowance for offsets, and I think what will be interesting for us when it gets to that is um, you know, we we our business relies heavily on agricultural commodities. Farms have a lot of opportunities um, to improve um, carbon sequestration, for example. Um, you know, we want to encourage farmers to to not create credits, but rather to you know use those emissions reductions that they achieve um, to lower the the emissions of the products that they're selling to us. So we're hopeful that we can have some pathways to reduce the, you know a, a significant amount of our emissions. But to to Z's point, there's no hard and fast rule on on how much we will end up needing to offset through. Um, you know, uh, offsetting programs, but I think kind of at the moment the perspective I have is that the the international various international organisations that um, create carbon credits that can then be used as offsets to uh, to retire against your emissions as an organisation. There's a lot of variation in the standard and quality of those carbon credits, and and we are wary of using low quality you know carbon credits to. To offset any emissions, so I think that's something that we'll need to see improvement in in how those organisations organisations operate going forwards. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I couldn't agree more that if 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 anyone does consider offsets as part of a carbon reduction strategy, at the end of doing all those other good things, they have to be high quality, robust offsets. Um, yeah. avoid, avoid the greenwashing trap. Um, mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there's a there's a kind of a final question which I'm going to paraphrase in two words, and that's just transition. This is about making sure we take the whole planet with us, so that it's not just the developed Western cultures that can get there. The, the question refers to Europe. I, I'd apply it to Australia and North America as well. But how do we, um, in the actions that we do, whether they're local or global, um, how do we try our best to make sure that what we're doing in terms of climate change and carbon reduction is an inclusive uh, way of working um, that it's not just for those privileged few who've got the who've got the funds fundamentally so Matthew if I could flip that to you first of all please yeah I think it's, it's a very important discussion I mean, it's live for local authorities around electric vehicles for example so yes we can invest public funds in EV charging infrastructure which is great um, but the reality is that benefits a, a small number of people probably who can afford an EV in in the first place so perhaps maybe our, our money would be best spent on active travel uh, measures or connections to public transport as well um i mean i think in the fuel poverty world th th there's a lot that can be done um you know in west london we are running a a, a government-backed scheme called green homes grant which is um focused particularly on those living in uh, d e f G related properties, energy performance properties, so low performing properties uh, on under £30,000 household income. And that's where that money is being prioritised. I think that's right. For those sort of um, state subsidised schemes, um, they should focus on those in need uh, living in poor quality um, uh, accommodation. And not only are you reducing emissions, but you're also helping those day in, day out with their, with their energy bills. Um, but it's not it's not a perfect answer, Chase. Uh, I, I think the, the long term aim, I think, must be to try and um, somehow uh, make low carbon choices also the cheapest choices. Uh, and that that requires maybe COP28, uh, you know, everybody getting their head together and thinking, how do we really incentivize economically low carbon choices? Because once you crack that, it'll take care of itself. Um, so, yeah, big challenge there. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Matthew. And I think that's you kind of anticipated my, my final question uh, because we, we've got a couple of minutes left. And uh, as you refer to COP28 is, is a year away, it will come around very quickly, um, as these things tend to do. It's in the United Arab Emirates um, next year, 30th of November to the 12th of December. Put it in your calendars now. Um, you've mentioned one thing there, you know, making the low carbon option uh, the cheapest option or the, the, the most value for money should be the phrase probably we should be using. Um, what other focuses do you think that COP should have, or that international level of discussion, I should say? What else should we be talking about? Z, if I could come to you for that final question first, please. I think it's actually a very touchy subject, especially because you um, just mentioned before about um, Pakistan floods. Um, Pakistan's my mother country, and um, 
I actually had new people who who basically lost their homes in in the floods and something which was, you know, just not something what they prepared. You know, there's there's corruption in the country. There's various different things that are going on, but you know, the, Pakistan's not a poor country. Like it's not a, you wouldn't class it as a, a poor country compared to many you know hundreds of others that are out there. Um, but and and in in terms of pollution as well in terms of climate change in terms of being the highest emitters it's nowhere near as well so having that scary thought of a country like pakistan being affected like that you know we're we're all you know it's something to 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 think about that we're all in trouble with with, with this no matter how much we, we we do so that's why we need to prepare we need to invest in the in the right techni- te- techno technologies out there um, we need to, there's many sm- SMEs that are working, small research groups that are working on um, developing new technologies to help climate change. You know, COP28 should focus on that, should look at that. I mean, for, for why Greta didn't attend um, COP27, greenwashing, exactly it felt like that. Our, our prime minister went for one day, you know, that's such one of the biggest things in, 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 in the global economy in the global world problems at the moment um, and attending just for one day just shows you know how much we're turning a blind eye to these things um, the delegations well, you know were similar as well you touched on the gas ones being the biggest ones there um, you know we need we need an act we need action we need to be serious about it so that's why I think COP28 and um, being in UAE now, UAE is um, has Mazda City. Um, sorry, I don't want to take too much time, but I'm just very passionate about this, James. And um, um, Mazda City is is the, you know a little small town that's been developed in 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 the UAE, which is you know zero carbon. Places like that need to be developed around the world. This is what we need to the technologies that we have there. Why can't we have them in the countries that are poor but have natural resources? infinitely available to them um, for energy generation and other things that that, that can help them. It's a big part. Thank you. Talking about it, to be no, that's great. And, and, and I love the passion. I love the passion. You're right. It's yeah. there's there's a lot more we can be doing. Um, Peter, to you, please. Um, I think I'll just be quick. The two things I'd like to see from my perspective, I like seeing um, you know, some of the big corporates making more uh, more more progressive partnerships um some of these industry-led uh collaborations on big projects or big initiatives um i'd like to see more of that and i'm hopeful that we will see more of that next year uh and then the one other piece from my side you touched on it james the the funds that have been committed for um some of these big adaptation projects i'd like to see more of that deployed and like to to see more of that um, being being talked about and discussed i think it was it was kind of ignored for large parts of cop 27 so it'd be great to hear more on that yeah indeed thank you peter excellent well we're pretty much at time um i just want to say thank you to my three speakers to peter to matthew and z some really interesting uh, presentations very diverse um ways of dealing with what is a truly global issue uh thanks for all your questions as well and the responses from the speakers um, uh, it's been really good to uh, be able to host this webinar. And my final parting shot is that um, another date for your diary, COP15 for the biodiversity crisis is kicking off in Montreal quite soon. They run in parallel, but they are very much intertwined, nature-based solutions. So um, sadly, it doesn't get the coverage that uh, that Egypt and Glasgow uh, have had, but um, just as important. So if you get time, tune into that, see what they're talking about for uh, the biodiversity crisis. But for now, um, we are at time. Thank you for your time and attention. Um, Have a good afternoon.